Hello, hello everyone. Today we are going to talk about power analysis and how it is used most of the time to estimate the appropriate sample size for an experiment. Let's start with the definition of power. It is the probability that a statistical test will reject a false null hypothesis, not the frontiers, right? Basically, it means that power is about the probability of detecting an effect, a difference of some kind, given that the effect is really there. In a nutshell, the bigger the experiment, the bigger the power, as in the more likely to pick up a difference. So the main output of a power analysis is the estimation of an appropriate sample size. And it is super important for several reasons. First, it could be that our sample is too big, which would be a waste of resources and an ethical issue if we work for, with mice, for instance. Or our sample could be too small, so it could well be that there is a genuine effect, but we miss it because we don't have enough power. That would also mean a waste of resources, by the way, because of a poor design. If we write a grant application, we need to justify the sample size we propose and more and more funding bodies are asking for the actual power analysis. Scientists hate it, of course, but it is a good thing really, as it makes people think more about experimental design. And it is good news for the mice. Finally, the publications. Reviewers are starting to mention power. If an author claims that there is no effect or no difference between, say, two genotypes, a reviewer may come back and say, wait, the difference you are mentioning seems interesting to me. Did you have a sample big enough to pick it up? So power matters. OK, so now how does power look like? We can try this figure and go over its elements, starting with the null and the alternative hypothesis. So here, we are thinking about the probability that an observed result occurs if the null is true. We have the null in red, that's the absence of an effect, and the alternative hypothesis in blue corresponding to the presence of an effect. We can also think of the red curve as, say, a control group and the blue one for a treatment group. Now we have alpha. The probability of a type 1 error, the one we make when we say, oh, there is definitely a difference here, whereas actually there is not. Now, we can never be sure, but we want to be as confident as can be. And that confidence usually corresponds to alpha equals 0.05. So the p-value that we get from a test quantifies the probability that the effect we observe occurred by chance alone. As I said, we can never be sure, but we draw the line at 5%. So we will believe that the difference we observe is real only if p is smaller than 0.05. Now, let's talk about the other type of error, the one we tend to forget, whereas we so should not, the type 2 error beta. Now, let's say that the area of the blue curve is 1. We can see that it is partitioned between power and beta. Beta is the failure to reject a false null hypothesis. In other words, it is the probability of missing an effect which is really there. And the power is the probability of detection of an effect which is really there. So we can see how the two are linked. There is a direct relationship between power and beta. The bigger the power, the smaller beta. OK, so the general convention is that power equals 80%. So keeping in mind that the relationship between power and beta, it follows that the accepted beta is 20%, which means that a true difference can be missed in 20% of the time, which is pretty high, right? And it is all because of Jacob Cohen. In 1988, this guy wrote a seminal manuscript on power. And he thought, okay, type 1 error is the big one because it can really have nasty consequences. So he went, let's say that the type 1 error is four times more serious than type 2 one. Then to quantify the type 2 error, we just have to go 0 0.05 times 4 is 0 0.2. Voila. Pretty arbitrary, right? But no one really argued against it because, well, first, no one really cared at the time. And then, second, people quickly realized that when comparing two groups, for instance, 90% power would mean an increase of 30% for the sample size and 95% with a 60% increase. And bigger samples mean means money, 
mean more money. So of course, 80% was good enough and still is, even though more and more people are starting to argue against it. Next, the critical value. When we compare sample means, we will always observe a difference, as means will never be exactly the same. But the question is, when do we call a difference significant and meaningful? So, a difference can be very small or very big, and somewhere we have to draw a line beyond which we call the difference significant. And that line is the critical value. And that crit critical value is of statistical nature as it is calculated using the information that matters, namely the size of the difference, the sample size on which we build the confidence we have in that difference and what we choose to call significant. Here is an example with the t-test. To understand more about the t-test, please check out the student t-test video. So here is an extract of the statistical table associated with the t-test. As I just mentioned, to estimate the p-value, we need to think about the significance level, usually 0.05. That's alpha. And the sample size, which is here represented by the number of degrees of freedom, df. I explain more about the degrees of freedom in the video on descriptive statistics, but basically we have n minus 1 degrees of freedom, so if we have a sample of, say, 15, we have 14 degrees of freedom, which give us, gives us that critical value. So the idea is to run a statistical test, here a t-test, which gives us a t-value, and that t-value is compared to the critical value. If it is bigger, bingo, we get a, a, a significant result. Now, the pow a power analysis is really about the relationship between six variables, the difference of biological interest, the variability of the data, both of which together will give us the effect size, the desired power, the significance level, the sample size, and the alternative hypothesis. First, the difference of biological interest. This is to be determined scientifically, not statistically. It is the minimum meaningful effect of biological relevance, as in the smallest difference that matters. The larger the effect size, the smaller the experiment we, we need to be to detect it. It means that we have to have an idea of the difference we are after before we run our experiment. It may seem counterintuitive, but it is not actually, as not every difference matters. Some are too small to be reported or explored further. So we need to determine the smallest meaningful one for us. And how do we do that? Well, from previous research or a pilot study, for example. Then the standard deviation. That's even more counterintuitive. We need to have an idea of the noise, the viability of our data before we have even collected it. It seems like an impossible task, and yet we need that information to determine our sample size. Now, we have to remember that pretty much always, we will be comparing group or groups of interest to a control of some kind. And this control, in all likelihood, will have been measured before. It is a wild type mouse or baseline that we or someone else will have used before. So the way to do it is to look at the viability of that control and use it to estimate the viability of our group of interest. OK. so. We've seen the first two variables. The following two we've talked about already, that's alpha and the power itself. Then the fifth variable is sample size, the one we are after most of the time. So we are left with the alternative hypothesis, which can be a bit confusing, actually. It is about choosing between one or two tailed tests, also referred to as one or two-sided tests. Now, the tails or size in, questions, in question are these here on each side of the distribution. This is the distribution of a difference. So under the null, we have a difference of zero. And as we move away from it, the difference increases and we are more and more likely to reach significance until we reach the critical value and then we do reach significance. It is really about the question we are asking. If it is, is there a difference? Then we look at either side of the distribution and we split the rejection region in two and we have 2.5% on either side. Or we ask, is it bigger or smaller? In which case, we look only at one side. 
Now, if we look at these two graphs, we can notice that the critical values are different between the, the two approaches. For the one-tailed test, the critical value is closer to zero than for the two-tailed one, which means that a smaller difference will be significant. So the choice of a version of the test will affect directly the likelihood of reaching significance. In fact, with the same data, it is two times easier to reach significance with a one-tailed test than a two-tailed one. Arguably, the choice should be led by the science and the actual question we are asking. But the truth is that more often than not, people use two-tailed tests, regardless of the question they are actually asking. Not that scientists are right to do so, but since one way to consider statistical tests is that there are tools we use to quantify our level of confidence in what our data are telling us, it makes sense to use these tools in a consistent fashion so that we could compare our findings with one of others. So two tails it is. One last thing, the power analysis should be done very early on and in any case before running the experiment. Thank you for listening and don't forget, stats don't have to be scary. Thank you.